sand. Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter 12. And we'll pray and get started, get right into where we're headed here this evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. And I hope and pray that you get something uh, eternal out of what we're about to do here. Uh, I think oftentimes people think church is just to make you a better person. No, it's not. It's to prepare you for eternity. And to prepare you so that when you hit the judgment seat of Christ, you have something to show for it. It's not just about making you a better moral agent. Uh, it's about uh, you living your life for Jesus Christ. Now we're studying a little bit about characters. And there's no greater character to study in the Bible than the devil. Uh, he's behind a lot of our uh, character flaws and things like that. So I'm going to just show you a few things uh, about him and about his attributes. And uh, just so that you know that all the time that you're in trouble, it's not always other people. Oftentimes, it is the devil. He tells you in Ephesians chapter number 6. Now, let me clarify this. I'm not trying to tell you that the devil's behind everything going on. But there's enough wickedness in the world today, ladies and gentlemen, for you to recognize that even without your involvement, the devil is beginning to turn things in that direction and the world is getting more and more and more evil. That's not an excuse to sin and that's not a losing statement. It's a, something to make you aware, to make you pay attention. But it doesn't mean you can accuse the devil. I heard a preacher tell a story one time that he was preaching and he said the devil was over in the corner and he was bawling and crying and all that kind of stuff. And he said, what are you crying about? And he said, I keep being accused of things I'm not guilty of. Well, I think a lot of times people blame the devil for their own devilment. And it's not the devil at all. So when I show you these things, these are things to make you aware, to, get, to educate you, to recognize that he has certain things that he does. And one of the things he likes to do, if Ephesians 6 is there, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness, and high places. All right? That means that when I'm having something going on, there's a spiritual entity to what's happening. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and as a result, you have an arch enemy, and that arch enemy is the devil. And he's going to fight you. He cannot take your soul, but he'll take anything else you'll yield to him or give to him. Now, one of the things he likes to do is accuse you, and sometimes he'll use the brethren to do it. And you want to be real careful about getting in on the devil's work. Look in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12. We'll pick it up in verse number 10, 12, 10. Oh, let's make it nine. There's a good one there with him being a deceiver. The great dragon was, out, uh, was cast out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, which deceiveth the whole world, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. That should shake you up. That's a future event, not just the one that's already occurred. That means he'll persuade some that are up there now to follow him. A third part in Revelation 12, a third part of the stars follow after him. Don't have time right now. Look in verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come the salvation and strength of the kingdom of our God and the power of, of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God. How often? Heavenly Father, would you please help us tonight? I realize what it is we're about to talk about and ask that you cover the place in the blood of Jesus Christ and protect us against the devil. We know we can't bind him. We know we're not charismatic and we're not going to charge hell with a squirt gun and full of gasoline. But would you please help us to make these trademarks known so that we're aware and so that we don't get caught up in what he does. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, I want to bring this to your attention. I want you to notice, first of all, he's known as a deceiver. He is a master of deception. He's a master as a, as a magician. He's a master at being able to make you think things are things that aren't really there. He, he can trick you. Uh, they have a thing that's out there right now. It has to do with all the social media and different stuff like that. And what happens is, is they watch what you like and what you don't like. I don't care if you don't believe this or not. You have to do a little research on your own to find it. But then what you'll find out is, is they'll start feeding you information uh, that goes along with how you believe and goes along with what you think. And before long, it'll hook you up with people that believe like you believe and act like you act and it'll make you think that everybody thinks like you think. That's deception. They don't think that way. That's done to get in your wallet to get your money from you. 
Amen, amen. You say, well, everybody believes like I do. Boy, this is really a thing. And then they put out the conspiracies or they put out whatever it is you want to do. And then they watch how you click and how you click. And they follow your metadata. metadata and then before long, they got all that stuff. And then they're pumping you and sending you ads of what you like and what you don't like. And people that you like and that you don't like. Did you know that you can go out there and you can say to that thing, here's what I'd like for you to do. Find people that are like me that believe like me. And it'll produce for you a list of people that you can contact that are just like you. They've turned over entire nations doing that. With false information. He's a deceiver. Let me ask you a question. Are you guilty of being like the devil? You ever deceived somebody when you said you're a Christian? I didn't say saved. I said a Christian. You ever deceive somebody when they ask you whether or not you're lying and you're... You're not really lying. You're just not telling the whole truth. John chapter number 8 says one of the attributes of the devil is he's a liar. Not just a murderer. You say, well, preacher, I, I'm, I'm not really a liar. Okay, are you a murderer? I never murdered anybody. You ever murder somebody's reputation? You can murder somebody by killing what other people think about that person. You ever have those conversations? You ever have those little snide comments, those little things that get said about uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ who are not perfect and they don't do right and they don't act right and you just kind of get in on that conversation and ruin their reputation? Yep. That's it. You know, just a text, just an email. It's not a really big deal or an emoji. And then the next thing you know, they've read what you wrote about them. You're, I don't know why you're praying right now. We're not ready to close the service. <laughs> That stuff's dangerous stuff you're fooling with. You say, who is the prince of the power of the heirs involved in it? Well, preacher, everybody does it. If everybody put their head in the fire, you're going to put your head in the fire? If that Bible says that when he comes to power, he can give power to the image and cause it to speak, shouldn't you be paying attention to what you're doing on that computer? Talking to that computer like it's a god? Plagiarizing stuff and using it to write your papers. We had to put out a statement with school because of some things I've learned recently. And if you're in school, you got it. That if you found out you're using this chat bot thing and that kind of a deal, it's immediate expulsion. You say, why? You're cheating. That's not you writing. And that's not the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Put your butt in a chair and spend some time in prayer and ask God to give you something. Don't sit there and ask a computer what he thinks about the second coming. I don't care what a computer says about the second coming. I'm wore out with that stuff. Techie, techie. I'm going to be techie. No, I'm not around here you ain't. You say, why? We already had people that have left because they come and they're watching on the, they're, they're reading their Bible on a, on a uh, computer. And I say something. Preacher, I just don't think you ought to say something. Okay, well, don't say something. I'm going to. You say, why? Because you ain't just doing that. You're checking your email and you're checking this and Baptist salute, you know, and you know, you're... You ain't Dick Tracy. I know what you're doing. You know, all of a sudden, uh, it's not, we're not here for church anymore. We're here to show off our new electronic device. Have you seen what I got? I got one that flips. I got one that flips. I got one that bends. I got one that won't break. I got one that's this, and I got one that's that, and all that kind of stuff. I want you to show us a new Bible you bought. Amen. I don't understand that stuff. You say, what is it? It's deception, and it's full of deception. And all you have to do is talk to somebody that has a little bit of sense of how they use that stuff. It's marketing. A hundred percent. And guess what? <laughs> You're the stinking little squirrel in the cage. You're the one that they're after. You don't think for yourself. You claim to. No, you don't. You ask some search engine. A deceiver. Make you think you're good. What it makes you think? You think you were built, ladies and gentlemen, to get 500 impressions of how you look every day? You think you were built for that? You wait till you get old and you look like a whiskey barrel with pipe cleaners for legs and then see how often you can't put your picture up there and have everybody go. <laughs> I mean, you talk about negative, man. Kids, I don't know how you do it, man. I'm not kidding you. I mean, I understand why the suicide rate has gone up for, for young kids under 12. You kids are going to, you think you're mad at me now, you wait till camp. They're going to be ready to fire me by the time I'm done with camp. You say, why? You're not listening to the voice of the Lord anymore. You're listening to another voice. 
Suicide rates are up in the youngins and suicide rate are among teen girls above boys right now. You say, why? You're putting out, what do you think about me? And I don't like this and I don't like that. You're not made to take 500 rejections a day to parade yourself around to see what the world thinks about you. You're not made to do that. You can't stand that kind of scrutiny. Drive you off the end of a cliff. What is he? He's a deceiver. He'll make you think you're all that in a bag of chips and then yank that carpet right out from underneath you. In the passage right here, you know what he says? In the passage here, he says he's an accuser of the brethren. Have you ever done the devil's work? You ever accused the brethren? I mean, a minute I'm going to show you a passage over the book of Daniel where it says he wears out the saints. You ever wear out the saints? You ever run that 40-foot tongue, ma'am, so long about other people and you have an attitude when you're around other people? You don't even have to say anything. People can tell what you're thinking by how you treat people. You ever done that? Are you an accuser of the brethren? Like there must be something wrong with them, right? Because you're not going to have anything to do with them. Well, it's funny to me, the people you do have something to do with... I mean, they may not be the best people in the world, ladies and gentlemen, but they're better than some of the people you run with. Amen. But you don't like them. So you accuse them. Because you know them, do you? I'm just asking you. you. You know what's going on. Well, you must. You're making a judgment call. I'm going to give you a warning. You better watch it. You're going to reap what you sow. The devil seems to get away with it for a while. He gets caught up with it later on. I'm asking you a question. Do you have the attributes of the devil? Are you a deceiver? Do you lie? Do you cheat on your taxes? Do you just, you know, if it's apropos, it's okay to be something you're not for the right set of circumstances? Because after all, you know, it's the norm in the world today. Take your Bible and come, if you will, please, over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Preacher, are you upset? You don't realize who I'm fighting right now. Amen. And it ain't no joke to me. Amen. I know what's going on. And I know who's behind it. And I can't stop him. I can just run to Jesus and ask the Lord to give me protection. But I can... Stop having his attributes. Amen. Amen. The devil's always giving you the negative side of things. Do you do the devil's work? Everything's bad. Everything? Do you only find what's wrong with everybody? That's the devil doing that. You know what the devil's saying? If God was good, he wouldn't be doing that. If God was good, He wouldn't be doing that. And you know what you're doing? You're amen in the devil when you're complaining. Yeah, I think that's right. Why would God do that? Why would God do that? And I think, you know, God, did you see what she did? Did you see what he did and all that? And you know what you'd think? You'd think the Lord must be hard up for policemen. I think that the Holy Spirit must be an invalid. Because we've gotten this impression that He needs us to tell Him what's wrong with everybody else. I got the Holy Spirit. He's just kind of bound up like Lazarus. And he's, you know, could you all please help me? I'm, I'm just so unaware and I'm not really omnipresent and I'm not really omnipotent and I'm not really omniscient. I, I, could you all help me? Can you all, can you all pimp out all the people around you that aren't doing right? Because I, I need you to tell me. I had a job in an investigation for a while and we brought in all these individuals and I finally, I, you know what I had to do? I'd just get out of the room and take a break because everybody that came in had something negative to say about everybody. I got fed up with it, man. Every time somebody came in, it's something else and something else and something else. I've never dealt with a bigger bunch of babies in all of my life. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. And then I'm thinking, why did my boss put me here? And the Lord said, you just did the same thing. <laughs> Got me. But you ever realize how much time you spend accusing? Say, but preacher, they did so and so. Yeah, I bet you did plenty to the Lord yourself. I'm just betting you did. And I'm betting that God's been gracious to you if the God's the same God as I have. 
And I'm betting there's some things, you know what you need to learn to do? You need to just let them go because he did. Don't raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you a question. It's a tough one. Are you ready? You ever done something and you know you deserve to get your hind end tore up? I mean from stem to stern because you did something and you know God knew it and you knew when you did it it was wrong and you deserve to get a whooping and you came down and asked Lord to forgive you and He forgave you and never mentioned it and never brought it up and never dusted your hind end and you can't forgive your brothers and sisters? What kind of Christian are you? I thought you said you weren't a liar. You said you're a Christian, didn't you? Well, doesn't the Bible say that you were forgiven some, not forgiven somebody? You're so Satan's device to be able to get a, some footholds in your, in your uh, life? You're not the devil's worker of iniquity, are you? You're not one of his ministers of righteousness, are you? I'm just asking. I don't know. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, if the devil can't stop you, he can certainly hinder you. Look in verse number 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but... What? He hindered us? You know what he says to Galatians? He said, oh foolish Galatians, who did hinder you? Who kept you from doing that? If the devil can't stop, you know what he wants to do? He'll throw a bunch of stuff in your pathway to slow you down and to try to deter you and try to discourage you and try to make you say, you know something? Paul said, man, I wanted to come to y'all. I wanted to come preach to you. I couldn't wait to get there. And guess what happened? The devil hindered me. Now let's just talk about personality traits for a minute. <laughs> Are you an encourager or a hinderer? Brother Mitch, could you grab this Kleenex box for me, please, sir? And just carry it back to your... I appreciate that. But you know what he could have said? Get somebody else to do it. I ain't your boy. Don't tell me to get no Kleenex box. Tell me to pick up a Kleenex... In front of all those people? You sending a message there, preacher? You know what he could have done? I guess. If you ain't got anybody else to do it. I, I just need to get it out of the way. If you could get it. Well, I get it when I get to it. Everybody don't work quite as fast as you do, preacher. You ever hinder anybody? I bet you don't hinder nobody on your job because your paycheck's at risk. You ever hinder God's work because you little slow in attendance or Bible reading or prayer? You ever hinder God's move in your life because you don't do right and live right? I'm just asking. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying, do you do His work by hindering? That's below my pay grade. I don't, I don't do stuff like that. Oh, okay. Well, what do you do? What, pray tell, might we ask you to do that you would grace us with your ability to do? I'm just, I'm just asking. <laughs> because it's interesting nowadays, there's so many stars in church you can't find Jesus. Paul said, I'll just do whatever they ask me to do. The Lord said, you want to be on top, be on the bottom. <laughs> be on the bottom. I ain't taking out no trash. I'll get somebody to do it. I ain't getting that on my hands. I ain't going to sweat, sweep up the dust, work out there in the craft room. I ain't got no air conditioning. Let that woman and her husband do that. They work with them kids anyway. I don't want to do that stuff. I get sweat, man. My makeup will. You don't do the work of the devil, do you? Hindering. How's your attitude? You ever hinder with your attitude? Ma'am, you ever hinder your husband because you got a bad attitude toward him about something? 
Sir, you ever hinder your wife because you got a bad attitude? You ever hinder another Christian because you got a bad attitude about somebody else? You're doing the work of the devil. You calling me the devil. Well, take it however you want it. The shoe fits, wear it. I'd call you the devil. I said it's the devil's attribute. Are you known to be an encourager or a hinderer? I watched an old lady one time. I, matter of fact, I'll tell you who it was. It's Mama Utley. And she gets up there and she's trying to get something, getting a piece of chewing gum off of the carpet that somebody went through there and got it. And instead of picking it up, they just kicked it along. And that's back when they had shag carpet there. And it's time. I watched that old woman get down. And she's old, man. And she's all twisted up and broke up. And she's getting down there. And I'm thinking, I can't get to her. I'm figuring, what in the world? Of course, she's known to get down to pray. So I'm thinking, you know, she's down there. She's picking around in that carpet trying to get that. You know what I got? a bunch of kids walking by her going she's down there because she cares about it being stuck in the carpet and everybody else is like what's she doing down there well because you won't get down there you're too good for it you wouldn't slide underneath the shoes in Chattanooga, Tennessee, underneath the pews over there, uh, being crippled up there because you had polio and lock your leg braces in and slide under there with a, a paint scraper and a mason jar and get the chewing gum off the bottom of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, pews in there because that was your ministry. No, you wouldn't be doing that. But boy, give you a chance to be in charge of something. You do that. Who wouldn't have him come ask you to go get a chair? Who are you to ask me to get a chair? I just need somebody to get some chairs. Could you get some chairs? We're like, we are crowded. Could you help me get some chairs? Yeah, tell the preacher to get his own chairs. Okay. Who did hinder you? Are you an encourager? Are you an Aaron and a her? Are you just always just, just, just holding it back? Just preventing it from happening. That's called hindering in the Bible. Take your Bible, if you will, please, and come to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4. This is a good one. The Bible says, And he led Jesus up to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the... We don't need to go any further. Do you do the devil's work by tempting people to doubt God's word? Play on words? No, I'm a King James Bible believer. Okay. Do you ever tempt people to do wrong because you believe you're a Bible believer, but you still aren't living according to what the Bible says? There it is. I mean, a little bit don't hurt. A little wine with supper. I mean, you know, everybody else does that. Beer on special days. Champagne toast on the 1st of the January. Just a little nicotine bump every now and then. A little pinch between your cheek and gum, you know. I mean, I mean, preacher, at least it ain't, you know, I'm, I'm not gambling or nothing like that. You know something, ladies and gentlemen, gambling and pulling a one-armed bandit is so far out of things nowadays. You know what people do nowadays? They say they're not sinning at all when they spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in front of a computer screen playing stupid games. Amen. So the preacher, that's the generation we live in. Then there's something wrong with the generation. Amen. I'm not just going to capitulate to it. Well, everybody does drugs now. Well, I'm not going to do drugs. Well, everybody drinks now. Well, I'm not going to drink. Well, everybody smokes. I'm not going to smoke. Well, but everybody does it, preacher. You just well accept. Everybody listens to rock and roll. I don't listen to rock and roll. I ain't going to. Yeah, well, you're old, preacher. We understand that. But you've got to understand what I've got to update, my, uh, update the Bible. It's still wrong. I don't care what generation you're in. It's still wrong. Just because preachers have stopped preaching the Bible and now you have a bunch of buffoons for kids that have been raised on a computer, don't you put pressure on me to tell me I need to update and understand I better go more by a computer than a Bible. You're smoking crack. Amen. This is a Bible-believing church, not an algorithm follower. First thing I have a tendency to do is to recognize 
you know something? There's a lot of ways to tempt somebody to do something that's wrong. You ever tempt somebody to cover for you? I remember four girls that got killed years ago right over off of Blanding. This is a lot of years ago, man. All four of those girls had told their parents they were at somebody else's house and none of the parents would follow up on it because they, they were embarrassed to call the parents of the kids. All four of those girls. Guy comes home early from the paper mill. He was sick, not doing well, driving a green pickup truck. And he comes down and he's got a green light. It's about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. A little bit of dew on the ground. It's kind of a cool evening there. And those girls came through that red light. Uh, you know, they weren't drinking. They, weren't, they were just out. They were just not supposed to be out at 2 o'clock in the morning. This one's with that one and that one's with this one. This one's that one. This one, that and the other. And they're all out riding with the 18-year-old girl. And he T-boned them and killed all four of them. Grade Yard did. So, well, preacher, what was the deal? They all lied to protect the other one. If one of those girls had said, I ain't lying. I ain't going. I ain't doing that. You might not have four white caskets set up across. It's on the front page. So, preacher, you're saying they're bad girls. I never said they were bad girls. I said they all deceitfully lied to their parents and said they were somewhere when they weren't. And they went out, and next thing you know, there's four graves. That car was so twisted up, man, they not only had to use the saw, they had to use the jaw of lives and pry that thing open, filled that thing with a wrecker, put a hook on the uh, top of that, uh, like a tuna fish can on the top of that car, and pulled that thing, I can hear that glass busting, yeah, pow, pow, glass popping like that, and pull that thing off, and they're all four right there. Not a one of them over 18. Tempted. You ever tempt somebody to do wrong? You ever set somebody up and tempt them to say something they shouldn't say? The devil, after 40 days, you know what he does? He comes to the Lord and he tempts him. You know the devil's temptations there? Every one of those temptations was right at the wrong time. Every one of them had an element of truth in it. Every one of them was misapplying scripture. And he used scripture to tempt people. Daniel chapter number 7. That's it. Look down, if you will, please, in verse number 25. I'm talking about the attributes of the devil. Verse 25. I, I get, you know, I think sometimes maybe I just haven't, maybe, maybe you don't really know where I stand. Maybe, maybe you've misinterpreted. You're not, you're, 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 maybe the jury is out on my position when it comes to this stuff. Well, I'm making sure you understand it. Amen. 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 This ain't no game to me. And this isn't my job. This is my calling. Amen. Don't be interpreting things for me. Ask me. I'll tell you. Look in verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Well, I don't know about you, but <laughs> He sure enough can wear me out sometimes. Amen. I mean, exhaust me. But then I got to look at it and find out whether or not it's an attribute I have. Do I wear people out with my unwillingness to change? Do I wear people out using whatever ability I have to run them down? Instead of using what God gave me to encourage people, I wear them out by just always being in the objective case and the kickative mood? Do I wear them out with a smart mouth and with snide comments and innuendos? I mean, am I known for just wearing people out? 
That's what the devil's known for. I'm not saying that that's you. I'm simply asking you a question. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll be done here in just a minute. I'm saying, do I have the, the attributes like Judas? You know, it's a strange passage in the Bible where the Lord comes up there and you know what He says? Judas betrays Him with a kiss. You know what He says? He calls Him friend. He was sitting and eating with Him. Judas is a devil. John chapter 6, verse number 70. Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot. I wonder if sometimes I hadn't been guilty of sitting down at the table of the Lord and acting like I'm his best buddy and then turn right around and betray him. I didn't say you, I said me. The Lord says to me, hey, how about doing so and so? And I said, well, we talk about that. <laughs> You know what I realize in my life? I realize 1% hesitation is 100% rebellion. You know what my answer should be to him? Yes, sir. Dragging my feet. Why? Well, Lord, you didn't give me something I want to do. You ain't going to mount much in life if you only get to do what you want to do. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And then I'll show you one in 2 Corinthians 10. This one goes along with 2 Corinthians 11. Remember the serpent beguiled Eve. He tricked her, right? How is that? He blinds her, only gives her certain information. Look in verse 4. And whom the God of this world, uh, that the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Well, preacher, that means the Satan that can blind their minds and help them where they can't see it. Yeah, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever blinded somebody's mind by only giving them half a truth? Your half of the story? Your side of the information? Your justification for feeling the way you feel? They don't get the other side of the story. They get your side of the story. Have you ever blinded their mind because you only let them hear one side of everything? Have you ever thought about how much you sound like, come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, have you ever thought about sometimes how much like a broken record you sound? And it's always the same people, isn't it? They just seem to rise to the surface of the conversation. Is it possible your mind's blinded? That person you can't stand right now, can you find anything good about them? Have you made his effort, a bigger effort to tell other people about the good that they do instead of all the bad they do? All the things they do that's not like you do it? So that makes you okay because you're just lazy? You take orders from somebody else but you ain't taking orders from them because you just don't like them? Just a thought. You know what the devil did when the Lord said to him, this is what I want you to do? The devil said, you ain't going to tell me what to do. What could you not like about God? You know what he said? <laughs> I'm going to put my throne above your throne. I, I'm going to be the most high. I'm going to tell you what to do. Well, I got to looking at that passage this morning in my reading, and I'm looking at that thing, and I'm thinking to myself, well, my goodness, that's the devil telling the Lord what he's going to do, not the Lord telling the devil because the devil didn't want to do what God told him to do. And I had to say, guilty. Amen. What's not to like about God? The Lord said, well, then why don't you do what I tell you to do? If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Right. You sure you don't have a little devil in you? Well, how come what I'm preaching to you right now, some of you turned me off 20 minutes ago. It's coming from Him. Amen. We just pick and choose, don't we? Several years ago, I was at a meeting and I, I did something. I wouldn't do it anymore. But I was at a meeting and I 
had an opportunity to preach at the meeting and I got a harebrained idea that uh, along these lines about crucifying Christ and so I went through and I started pulling, you know, uh, uh, pulled the robe off, the, pulled the back end off the Bible like that and I started reading certain things that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to do, like study to show yourself, I don't like that, you know, give attention to read, tear that one out and, you know, and so on and so forth. And I'm reading a bunch of them, just, I had pages flying all over the place and that kind of a deal. And the people got really mad about it. And I don't blame them. I was tearing up a Bible. But then I did say this to them. But what's the difference in what I did physically and what you do when you're disobedient? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. <laughs> Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. <laughs> Children, obey your parents, for this is the first commandment with <laughs> that your days may be long upon the earth. See? <laughs> What's the difference in what you do and what I did physically? We pick and choose. We do what they used to call cherry pick. What about the verses on your attitude? Don't we need help there? I, let me, I need help there. Boy, when the Lord puts the thing down like that, and then he, he doesn't look and he says, yeah, look at all them. You know what he says? Yeah, I'll meet you under the desk, boy. And I'm down there with a Bible on the floor, and I'm down there, and I'm looking at that thing, and I'm thinking, whew, man, I got more attributes of the devil than I do the Lord. You know what that devil said? You ain't going to tell me what to do. And you know what you do? You follow the devil when you say, I ain't going to tell me what to do. Okay. I can't, but the Holy Spirit should be able to. Are you in 2 Corinthians 10? Requires a mind change. And I don't mean just changing an object. I had a conversation with a young lady. You have to understand this. When I, I'm going to give you an illustration here. But when we talk about changing your mind, it's not just changing the object of what you're focused on. It's literally changing how you're thinking about what it is that's got your captivated your attention. You're in dangerous situation. You say, why? You are being brainwashed every day. And if you don't counter it with spiritual things, you're done. You'll get to the judgment seat of Christ. You'll go, man, I hope they got a dump truck big enough to put all that stuff in. And the devil's going to say, you mean wood, hay, and stubble? <laughs> we got a semi-load, son. Oh, no, no. Gold, silver, precious stones. No. No, all that stuff you did for yourself. Second Corinthians chapter number 10, he says this, For we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Now you know what he just said? If something comes up and it's contrary to God's word, he said you've got to bring it into captivity. What does that mean? You don't just change the object. You change how you're thinking about it. I'm preaching on that stuff about forgiveness and something came to your mind and that thing stuck in there and the Lord said, forgive them, pray like Job did, pray for them. And you're saying, I ain't doing it. And the Lord said, you better get it into captivity. And so what you do is you change it from being me to changing it to being John, but it don't make no difference. You change the object, you didn't change how you thought about it. How should I have thought about it? God says it's wrong, period. Amen. Amen. I got to stop it, period. Not just change the object. I got to change how I think about it. And a Christian is measured by uh, his, his response or his obedience to what the book says. And if you're not willing to do what the book says, you're not going to amount to much as a Christian. You'd be saved and you'd be in church. And then you'll, after a message like this today on just a Wednesday night, a little Bible study, um, you'll be mad and you'll leave. And you'll go find somebody else to make miserable and upset because you won't get right with the Lord. And we're all guilty. This ain't the pulpit preaching down to the pew. We're all guilty. And every one of us have some personality traits that resemble more uh, the devil and the old nature than it does the new nature. And all of us need to make some serious course corrections. And realize you are in a battle for the spiritual well-being at the judgment seat of Christ. And this is more than just about you and your personal feelings. Amen. Amen. 
This is about him and what he wants to get done and what he wants to use this church for. But boy, when judgment begins at the house of the Lord, because you're so much better than the charismatics and the Catholics and everybody else, then I don't really need all that kind of stuff. Okay, well, then just take it, chalk it up, and the Lord didn't have anything for you tonight. I'll try to feed you on Sunday. But if you got something tonight, then why don't you do this? Why don't you consider going home tonight and meditating on it and praying about it and say, well, that wasn't a class in rightly dividing, but... <laughs> We didn't learn about Genesis 1 and 6, but whew, I learned some things about me. I don't like what I saw this morning. I see those little things just slip in there. They're just little slivers. They're not, they're not, they're not a big deal. They ain't as big as a razor blade. But boy, before long, they have cut you from stem to stern, and you are bleeding out spiritually. And then you listen to the way you're talking and thinking, man, something's wrong with my heart. Amen. 